uh, with that, um, we'll uh, we'll start with another event uh, for today's keynote. Uh, so today will be Brian Harvey, and he's going to uh, present a history of metaprogramming. So I think most people know Brian uh, at this point as well, but Brian is uh, you know the other half of the Brian and Yen's team uh, that developed Snap along with you know the wider community. But Brian is one of the ones who uh, is always there to uh, give us context, give us history. Um, and it is Brian who is constantly the one uh, pushing the envelope for uh, you know things like metaprogramming. Uh, I'm sure we'll hear a little bit about macros in today's keynote um, and many of the sort of interesting, amazing, um, and totally uh, you know seemingly out there concepts uh, that we have learned that we can actually make pretty easily in Snap. So with that, I'll turn it over to Brian for his for his talk, a history of metaprogramming. Okay, uh, thank you, Michael. Let me see if I can share my screen. Like this. Uh, and the answer is my screen sharing is paused. Why do you suppose that is? I'll resume share. Is this working? A little not. black screen. Uh, okay. Um, I'm stopping. So let me unshare and try that again. Sorry for the confusion. Share screen. Um, desktop two. Um, there we go. Yep. Screen sharing. Okay. Well, excellent. So um, I'm here to talk about metaprogramming. Um, I have to apologize for uh, being a little bit late on preparing this talk. So I actually was doing it still at 9.15. So we'll see how this goes. Um, I'm mostly French. Uh, okay. Um, okay, what's metaprogramming? Um, here's a quotation from Wikipedia. Um, and they say uh, a programming technique in which computer programs have the ability to treat other programs as their data. So programs treating programs as data. Um, so program can read, generate, analyze, or transform other programs and even modify itself while running. Um, and this allows us to handle new situations without recompilation. Um, metaprogramming can be used um, for various optimization purposes, but also to generate code using compile time computations. Um, uh, this article is really written for compiled languages rather than interpreted languages like SNAP. But um, finally, we have the ability of a programming language to be its own meta language is called reflection. Uh, reflection is a valuable language feature to facilitate meta programming. And you'll see that uh, that isn't quite the case for SNAP. And so we had to um, find a way to translate between uh, programming programs and something that we can manipulate. So our higher order functions metaprogramming? Um, and the answer to that is yes and no. Uh, I'm raising this question because we've had higher order functions from the very beginning. Um, it's one of our central features. Uh, and it's sort of program using programs as data. Um, 
So here's this um, example picture map uh, blank times blank over a list of numbers. Um, map is using times as data. So it's kind of meta programming, but when we're using higher order functions, our emphasis is on functions rather than uh, computer programs. Functions in the mathematical sense, where uh, there's a correspondence between oops, what did that happen? Between input values and output values. Um, in a programming language, we can't really represent, this is true of any programming language, we can't really represent functions directly. What we can represent is algorithms for computing functions. Uh, and that's what a program is. Um, but even though we're looking at programs, um, what we really care about is the underlying function. Um, so uh, what matters here is that we're taking the squares of some numbers. And the fact that in SNAP, we do that with these gray rings um, and empty input slots and so on, that's syntax rather than the meaning of a higher order function. So we're gonna look at metaprogramming in a way that it gets closer to the actual block notation. So here's an example of the ability to treat programs as data. Um, and oh, these examples, by the way, are all in the uh, new chapter on metaprogramming in the manual. Um, so, um, my blocks um, gives you a list of all the blocks um, in your workspace. And then we can ask about any particular block. Is it a custom block versus a primitive block? And we can keep the ones that are custom blocks uh, in this list blocks. And then, um, this next line called without defaults um, basically is to strip um, any default inputs out of the block. So move 10 steps is how the block looks in the palette, but we're really interested in move blank steps. Um, and that's what this set line here does. And then finally, uh, we just use keep to keep the items um, whose uh, definition, this yellow thing, um, contains move blank steps. And so here we see square and triangle which is the result of doing that. Um, so that's a classic example of using programs as data. Um, the other uh, important use of metaprogramming is to generate uh, blocks. So I want a block called first, that's item one of a list, second, that's item two of a list, and so on. But I don't want to define all of these by hand. So I write a procedure ordinals. Um, and uh, the key part here is um, define uh, block, and then um, we're going to take the name of the block, like second or third, um, and stick an underbar after it, uh, which represents an input slot. And then the body of that is going to be called uh, item num of stuff. Looking ahead a little bit, it, it's a little tricky to construct this piece of code because the variable num is a variable of procedure ordinals, but it's not part of the environment of procedure first, second, third, and so on. 
So what I have to do is evaluate num in the context of uh, the ordinals block itself. Um, and uh, but stuff is going to be evaluated in the environment of first or second or whatever one we call it. So that's a little bit of complexity that uh, is part of the history that we're going to be looking at. Um, oh, by the way, I should say ordinal numbers are things like first, second, third, fourth, as opposed to cardinal numbers, which are things like one, two, three, four. Um, so that's why this program has that funny name. So out among real programmers in the real world, um, they typically do their metaprogramming uh, by manipulating text strings. So here's a little program example that um, I made up in C. I'm defining a macro foo uh, that takes and input x, and it says, um, put quotation marks around the x, that's what the number sign means. And then there's this funny closed parenthesis that's part of the macro. Um, and that's a little weird, uh, but if I use the macro in a program, here's a call to printf, uh, print formatted is what that stands for. Um, and this uh, mumbo jumbo says um, print uh, the next input as a string uh, followed by a new line character. So we call foo of 87 and that prints 87. Well, here, this printf has an open parenthesis that's not matched with a closed parenthesis. So how come this works? Well, this programming error is counteracted by this programming error of having an unbalanced closed parenthesis. Um, so that's a little strange. Um, it's good because you can make your own syntax. So people do play games like uh, define begin to be left curly brace, define end to be right curly brace. And um, then they can turn C into, I don't know, Pascal or something. Um, but it's bad because when you make a mistake in your macros, it's really, really hard to figure out what's going on, as you can see in this little example here. So um, the whole history of um, improving programming language design really comes back to Lisp um, because um, the structure of Lisp is the structure of uh, lambda calculus. Um, which means it follows a piece of mathematics rather than just arbitrary what programmers felt like doing. So in, in Lisp 1.5, which is um, the first Lisp uh, that ever was um, stable, there was a Lisp 1, of course, but nobody ever saw it outside of MIT. Um, so they specify four kinds of procedure. Subbers was their name for primitive procedure. Subber stands for subroutine. Um, and that's a procedure that's built into the evaluator. Uh, Expers, um, I keep losing my cursor. Expers stands for expression. Um, and that's code written in Lisp. Um, and there were two variants of these, and this is the important thing for our purposes, um, F subber, 
is special forms. So things that don't follow the normal um, procedure evaluation rules. Um, and F expert is user defined special forms, um, things that look like this, but the syntax is uh, out of the ordinary. Um, mostly this has to do with order of evaluation. In practice, the, the important uh, point about um, F experts versus experts or F subbers versus subbers is that the ordinary ones follow applicative order evaluation, which means first you evaluate the input expressions uh, and that gives you the input values and it's the input values that get passed to the procedure that you're calling. Um, by contrast, in normal order evaluation, um, you take the expressions themselves and pass them uh, to the procedure. Um, so uh, special forms are special mainly in that um, they follow normal order evaluation rules, meaning uh, inputs are not evaluated before giving them to the procedure. And also uh, the inputs could be variadic, which was not the case for ordinary procedures in uh, the, this very early version of LISP. Um, so having that change, not evaluating the inputs, uh, was enough to let you sort of make up your own programming language with pretty much any syntax, as long as it still looked like um, LISP data. So the reason in LISP, uh, everything comes in parentheses, which people laugh about all the time, is that that's the notation for lists, for data lists. Um, and so LISP is self-reflective. LISP code and LISP data are exactly the same thing. Um, so what you could do with these macros um, is uh, you can have uh, snap style um, title text in between input slots. Um, and your macro would just skip over those or check to make sure they're what's expected or distinguish two different functions based on uh, title text that's in between inputs. Or you can do something that was very common uh, among early Lisp users is to make uh, normal uh, infix ar arithmetic expressions where the operator goes in between the two operands. Instead of the usual Lisp notation for arithmetic, which, um, oops, which is prefix form. I don't know why this keeps happening, but moving on. Um, normal order was the only thing you need for macros uh, in a dynamically scoped language, which was the case in early versions of Lisp. Dynamic scope means um, if you use a variable inside a procedure, but that variable is not defined, it's not a script variable. Uh, in snap terms of the procedure. Um, you have to find it someplace outside the procedure. Dynamic scope, you look in the environment of the procedure that called this one. So this procedure automatically has access to its caller's variables. Um, and that's what you want for macros because you're going to construct a piece of code that has to make sense uh, in the context of the caller. So it might use variables provided by the caller. Um, so that's very convenient and it means we don't have to uh, special case macros with respect to scope. Um, but because uh, you're using both the macros 
variable namespace and the caller's namespace, uh, you can have bugs in which the same name is used in both environments and you don't get the one you're expecting. Um, when Scheme came along, um, it introduced uh, lexical scope instead of dynamic scope. Um, there was lexical scope before Scheme, but it wasn't really the standard thing in Lisp until Scheme came along. Um, and once you have lexical scope procedures, uh, writing macros gets more complicated. Um, they have to use their own variables, which is what you want, but they also need a way to access callers variables. Um, so one solution to that problem was uh, macros that are evaluated twice. So the macro is a piece of code that is evaluated just as, in, as for any procedure um, in the caller's environment. Um, so this is an example um, from an early version of Scheme. Uh, I want to define um, con stream uh, with some arguments, and I write an expression that makes reference to those arguments. So here's the first argument, and here's the rest of the arguments. And what makes this con stream is that this delay. Um, so we don't compute, we compute the first item in a list right away, but we don't compute the rest of the items until we need them. That's how, that's what streams are. Um, but inside these argument expressions are going to be references to variables that belong to the caller rather than to the macro. And so on eval twice macro, it constructs this piece of Lisp code. And then because this says define macro instead of just define, the piece of code that you construct is evaluated a second time in the environment of the caller. So it gets to use the variables belonging to the caller. Um, and this, in fact, is how macros work in Berkeley Logo, um, another programming language that uh, I was one of the developers of. Um, but uh, again, this isn't so great because it, it introduces the possibility of confusion between the macros variables and the callers variables. And so modern scheme has this idea called hygienic macros um, in which uh, there's a very clear separation uh, saying, you know, right now I'm looking at my own variables, the macro, and over here I'm looking at uh, the variables belonging to my caller. Uh, so we don't quite do that. Um, but more importantly, uh, SNAP isn't self-reflective. So code in SNAP is blocks, um, and the blocks are not data in SNAP. Well, they weren't until now. Um, again, you can take uh, some code and put a gray ring around it, um, and that makes it uh, data, but not data you can look inside of. All you can do with a ringed script is run it. Um, you can't sort of tear it apart and look at the pieces. So the solution to this problem is to have two translation procedures, one that turns a piece of code into a syntax tree, uh, which is a list structure containing um, the pieces of the program, and uh, syntax tree to code. Uh, what SNAP 8.0 does is it uses two 
uh, functions that originally are for text processing, there's split by, now traditionally split by, you say split by line or split by word uh, or split by character, uh, whatever. But now we have a new option split by blocks um, that takes a piece of code, a ringed um, uh, script or expression, split it by box, creates a list in which um, some of the items are the blocks of the code um, without input values. And then the remaining uh, items in the syntax tree uh, provide values for those inputs. Um, so in this case, the outer dark red list has two arguments, two inputs. One is a smaller list and one is a, a letter D. And if you look at the result picture, there's a list block um, and its first input is the result of another list block whose inputs are A, B, and C. Uh, and then the second input to the outer list is D. Um, <clears throat> so this is what we mean by uh, a syntax tree. Um, the particular format that's used here is not the way programming language people typically talk about syntax trees in which there are um, explicit categories of things like you would say procedure call and then underneath that would be um, the procedure and then a list of inputs which would themselves be expressions. Um, but this is how we do it. Um, logo, side note, uh, the earliest logos had text and define. Text takes a block and gives you a, a list structure of the code. And then define takes that list structure and lets you define a new block. Uh, after maybe doing some modifications to it. Uh, later logos, some of the later logos don't have text and define because uh, they were thought to be um, advanced things that most people didn't need. Um, this is sort of controversial saying, let's leave something out of the language uh, because most people aren't gonna use it. Um, For a long time in Scratch, uh, they kind of hid the fact that there were lists in the language um, because they thought people weren't going to use lists. And this is in the early, early days of Scratch. Um, and then in Scratch 1.4, they added the list box uh, that they use. Um, how am I doing on time? It is the computer is not telling me. Um, it's I'm almost out of time. Okay, I will speed up. Um, I'm almost done anyway. That's really good. Okay, so how do we do meta programming in Snap 8.0? Uh, there are two main parts of it. One is the conversion between code and syntax trees that I talked about split by blocks is a new thing that um, turns code into syntax trees. And join, if you give it a syntax tree as its input list, um, gives you the, the ring function that corresponds to that syntax tree. Uh, the other piece of um, metaprogramming is the part that's specifically about block definitions, the code inside uh, a user-written block. And we have definition of block that takes, here's the box square, 
and it looks inside the definition of square and here's what it finds. Um, and it tells you the, the code inside the block and also the formal parameters, the names for the inputs. Um, and the other half of that is uh, modifying a procedure, the set definition, uh, which changes the definition of existing block. And there's this new define thing that um, creates a block out of nothing, out of air. Uh, and that's it. Um, leaving eight minutes if anybody has any questions. Yeah, Brian, we ended 15 after, so I think you have 23 minutes. Oh, I have 23 minutes. Okay, even better. Um, so, oh, quick question. So, how are um, if you uh, if you're looking at the syntax tree for uh, a bunch of command blocks that are connected? Mm -hmm. may have variadic inputs. Uh, how is yeah. that represented in the AST? In other words, how do you disambiguate between the next block and an input slot or block yes. that's in, in an input slot? Yes. Um, this is, uh, you, you put your finger on a slight weak point in the way uh, we do syntax trees. Um, it's not so bad for um, examining code because, um, let me see, I might, maybe I should start screen sharing again. Ugh. I hate my life. Okay, now I can see what I'm doing. I can say share screen. Um, I need to start slideshow. Um, okay, slide. And it takes a while to do that. Okay, can you see my screen? Not yet. Yeah. Not yet. Oh, really? Oh, bummer. Okay, so let me come over here and, um, oh yeah, I have to click on share. Now I can see my screen, yeah. Okay, so um, here's an example of what you're asking about where we have a variadic list block um, inside a larger uh, list block. And these two list blocks are uh, clearly delineated. Um, uh, so the inner list block has A, B, and C as its arguments, its inputs, and the outer list block has all of that as the first input, and then D as the second input. Um, what's not so easy is the other way where you want to, um, what you have is list structure, a, a syntax tree, and you want to turn it into a block. Um, and in particular, uh, you want to give this variadic list block a number of arguments that's different from what it was expecting. Um, and there's a special mechanism for that where um, the first, at the beginning of the list of inputs, you put a number which says how many there are. Um, so that's a little complication. Um, Got 
Gotcha. Thank you. But yeah, that's how we do it. Um, very uh, cool talk, by the way. I'm excited to use this kind of stuff in that spot for auto videos. <laughs> Sorry, I completely missed that. Oh, uh, thanks. That makes sense. Um, yeah. And I was saying, great talk. I'm excited to use this kind of stuff for uh, like AST based auto graders and stuff like that in Netsbox. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> um, yeah, auto grading is is certainly one of the purposes of something like this. Other Brian, question? Yeah. You showed a, a comma and a back quote. Do you want to show the code for that, or how to have users uh -huh. to use that? I do not want to show the code for that because, or, it, or how to how to get to it at least, so we can make use of it. Doesn't work. Yeah, the the problem is that it doesn't really quite work yet. It works in some cases, but not others. Um, so, uh, Snap eight point one will have back quote as um, as the library thing. The um, See if I come here. Uh, what Dan is talking about is um, this back quote. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, I see. When I move my trackball, it changes slides. That's bad. Okay, so. Uh, what this is is a, a helper procedure for dealing with um, code as data. And sometimes you want to have something that's almost quoted. So the result that you want is almost exactly what you put in as an input expression. But you want some particular thing uh, to be evaluated instead of being just literally there. So here I'm constructing the uh, like the item five of stuff that you see as the body of uh, fifth, right? Um, so if we look at fifth, in its environment, when you call it, um, there's just stuff and not any variables. Uh, that belong to the macro, such as uh, num, which is what number we're up to. So in order to get this five in, uh, in the procedure, I would have to um, either manually work out exactly where this five belongs and um, Stick in, uh, you know, uh, num in front of uh, a quoted list, a constant list, but instead back quote, uh, it looks inside the input that you give it for commas. And comma means take the thing that comes after the comma and evaluate it in the context of the macro. So when I'm making the procedure fifth, uh, this will be item of stuff that'll be unchanged in the definition. But because of this comma num, I look up the value of num during the running of the macro um, to generate the five. Um, okay, thank you for asking that. Um, any other questions? Um, just maybe this is not all that interesting, but you, when you talked about, you know, higher order functions and how these are kind of mathematical and mapping, mm -hmm. you know, multiplied, but there's a lot of other higher order things like the continuations and there's even the call CC and so on and yep. snap. So that that you you sort of gave the impression that the higher order programming is just purely for mathematical functions, but that doesn't seem to match the reality, is it? Well, if by mathematical you mean numeric, uh, then you're right. That functions are not necessarily numeric. Um, I should have clarified that. What I meant by mathematical is that. Um, 
it's not the algorithm that you're interested in. It's the result of the algorithm, the input-output behavior of the function considered as a black box. Um, so I always give the example, um, uh, if we say f of x is equal to um, 2x plus 6, and we say g of x is equal to 2 times parenthesis x plus 3, um, are those the same function or different functions? Uh, and the answer is they're different algorithms. In one case, you add first. In the other case, you multiply first. But they compute the same function. So mathematically speaking, f is equal to g, whereas sort of computer sciencely speaking, they're not. Uh, that was really the only point about that. And uh, I mean, you know, the the boundaries are fuzzy. So you know, I wouldn't want to say that we've never had anything like metaprogramming before. Uh, and you're right, continuations are an even better example because. Um, they let you change the flow of control in your program. Um, but those aren't all there is to metaprogramming. There, and with uh, higher order functions and continuations, there was still this missing piece where we look at the actual notation um, and can manipulate the code at the notation level. So a complete different question is you, you gave that example of you know finding callers of a of mm -hmm. a block. So is that working in eight point zero or does it require eight point one? And is it is there a library or uh yeah, no, this um this works right now. Um in eight point zero. Uh it depends on um I guess I should uh, well, now I've done it. Ah, there we are. Let me um, share my screen again, but share the whole screen so you can see how messy my desktop is. Um, if we go into uh, Snap, let me widen the uh, palette area a little bit. Um, so there are five blocks in the control category that are new um, for metaprogramming. Um, I didn't mention delete block, that's you know, trivial. Um, and it's obvious what it does. Um, so we have a setter and a getter for the various pieces of a block. And what are the pieces? Well, uh, its label is sort of the title text of the uh, block as seen from the outside. Definition is the code in the block. Um, category is a uh, palette category, what color it is, basically. Is it a custom block? Is it a global block as opposed to sprite local or script local? Um, uh, is this block a command or a reporter or a predicate? Um, scope. Okay, now I'm trying to remember. Oh, scope is related to uh, global question mark. Um, where can we see this block? Um, and slots is um, the nature of the input slots. So you can do things like, um, you know, make a, a list symbol for a list flavored input or an oval like this for a function labeled input. 
Um, and then underneath there's some more things that aren't exactly visible in the code, but um, are there. Uh, defaults is, um, you know what defaults is, it's like the 10 and move 10 steps. Um, menus and editables um, have to do with the ability to have um, a menu as an input, just like uh, definition of block, this definition thing is a menu. Um, and using set menus of a block, you can specify the items of the menu. And you can also specify whether it's um, read only like these, uh, which are the, the background color of the menu is the background color of the block, um, or there are writable menus that have a white background and you can ignore the menu and just type a value in like uh, the turn block, which sort of prioritizes north, south, east, and west, but you can just type in any number you want. Um, uh, then there's um, this script. So this is a, an interesting thing where we're not quite there yet in 8.0. Um, if you're going to say, uh, evaluate this expression in the environment of my caller, how do you say that part about in the environment of my caller? Um, the answer is uh, an extension of, whoops, wrong kind of blue, uh, the of block, uh, which is here somewhere. I can never find. Here we are, the of block. Um, so what's new in 8.0 is that in this write input, uh, which is normally an object like a sprite or the stage, um, or uh, in principle, other kinds of objects like costumes um, and sounds, uh, you can also put um, a, a ringed block in here. Um, and then on the left, put a piece of code that you want to run. And so you can say, run this in the context of that. Um, maybe that will be clearer. Oops. If I go um, call with context. Um, so this first thing says, uh, if you don't provide a context, then we just call it the regular way. But otherwise we call, and then we use this of block to take the function and the environment in which it's gonna run. Um, so that's how you, that's how we run things in, in other environments than the one we're in. And that's that makes this of block part of the metaprogramming uh, so hmm. pseudo category of blocks. It's not a category in the technical sense because there's these control colored blocks. And then there's this sensing block of, and then we have the um, split and join, which are operator colored blocks. Um, and I think that's it. Have I forgotten any better programming related block? I don't think so. I don't think that's everything. So Did I answer the question? The, but the, this script, you could use it in this as a context here or? Um, yeah, uh, you can take any ring block if you want to and use it as a context. Um, but I mean, the, this script. Oh, this, I'm sorry, yeah, the, this script block, yes. That um, reports the context that you're in right now. Um, so if you're writing a macro, 
this script is the macros environment rather than the callers environment. And so right now in 8.0, we have to use this explicitly um, by passing it in from the caller to the macro. If you want to use, if you want to be able to look things up in the caller, uh, that now has to be explicit. Um, we're going to uh, eventually, like, help 8.1 um, make it so that when you're defining a procedure, you can declare it to be a macro, and then it automatically gets its caller's uh, environment as a sort of invisible input. Um, I should, since we have a few minutes, um, the question came up um, about the sort of who's going to use this. This is not stuff for me to use with kids in my class um, question. And uh, there's two answers to that. One is, uh, yes, that's right. Probably not every kid is going to get into metaprogramming. Um, but the other is that teachers and curriculum writers will be able to use metaprogramming uh, to create microworlds, um, to create environments with extended block capabilities, different syntax, uh, whatever uh, they want to do. Um, so in the talk, I, in one of the slides, I gave the example of infix arithmetic instead of prefix arithmetic. Uh, as something that um, this uh, macrologists have invent all the time as, as sort of an exercise. Um, I have a simple question, Brian. Okay. Could you simply show how you would um, make square? Yeah. Um, I think I can do that. So I'm going to, well, let's see, what I'm actually going to do is make a new, um, less make cluttered. The text, make the text a little larger. I'm not seeing too well. OK. Um, oops, I can do that. Is that better? Yes, much. Great. Okay. So, um, define block. So, I'm going to say this the label of this block is square underscore. Underscore is going to be the size input. And then I'm going to say, well, what's how is it defined? So, inside this ring, um, I'm going to have an input called size. And then I'm going to say um, for I'm drag size in here. And then nine degrees. Um, and I actually had already defined square here, so I'm going to undefine it um, for now. I'll delete square. And now, if I run this define, ah, well. You don't see square here, do you? And that's because I neglected to say um, set category of this new block that I just made to motion. 
What's the character after the N in motion? After the M and oh, after the N, that's yes. a space. Uh, and you're right, it doesn't belong here. I was confusing it with the label. Um, so now go back to the motion category and I make square. Here's my box square. Um, now this input is of type any, and I really would rather that it be a number. Um, so I can say, oops. Set slots of this block to, in this case, there's only one input slot. So I can just say number like that. And so here's my square with the input type of number. Does that answer your question? It starts it. Thank you. Yeah. How, do, how many things does it know? Number and what else? Um, oh, all the things in the long form input dialog. So, you know, if I edit square, click on size, um, there are all these different kinds of inputs. And you can use any of them. Okay, thank you. Um, so let me put in a plug for um, the new chapter 11 um, of the reference manual. Uh, it's not chapter 11 to say that metaprogramming is bankrupt. Um, it just happened to coincidentally come out that way, um, which gives a bunch of examples and a, a thorough uh, explanation for all the different bells and whistles. Um, and the break should have started four minutes ago. So I guess we're done, right? Oh, who's in charge here? I found this wonderful work. Oh, thank you. There you go. Um, I, I was muted while I was speaking. Yeah. I'll let Mary ask her question um, since her hand was raised. But so Mary, why don't you ask your question? And then yes, there is a break. So uh, I dropped the link to the OEA session if folks would like to go to that, but we might as well get one last question in. Uh, thanks, Michael. Brian, I was curious, is there a way, I couldn't quite figure it out on my parallel screen, but I just started playing with this. So maybe I missed something. Is there a way to programmatically change the code of an existing block? So like with your, your square example? Yeah. What about an yeah. existing so square that, block and make it just draw three sides instead of four? Yep. Could you um, that to figure it out? Yep. Um, there's, um, I use the define block to define square. Mm -hmm. But then I use the set you know, some property of the block to mm -hmm. change the color and so on. You mm -hmm. can say set definition yeah. of square. And then- I couldn't figure out how to edit the list. Oh, I see. Um, and how okay. to actually give back a, a reported list. Um, you could just re overwrite the definition, right, Brian? You, can you go you back could, to yeah, sharing, I think your, sharing what, your screen and change it yeah, to three? Yeah, could you model it really quickly? It should be helpful to see. Yeah, it. I can try. What what Mary wants to do is... Um, First, why don't you get the definition of the square block? And you just oh, bring it up on the stage. Just to yeah. show what the get definition would look like. Oh, I see. Get definition, right? Because that—that's um, what this question is. Because get definition. Yeah. So definition of block square mm -hmm. gives me the ring with the the body and the formal parameters, the input names. So now. Um, if I take 
the definition of square and um, I split by blocks, I get this, which um, let me make this a little bigger. One of the things on my someday list is to have a better way of representing um, deep lists. Well, we could do it in list view, I guess, but that's huge. Um, so instead, let me just double click on this. And you can see that this is the move size steps block. And um, this is the turn 90 degrees block. Okay. So now what I want to do is um, wait, that can't be right. I missed something. Oh, right. At the very top of things is the repeat thing. So what I like to do is um, only draw three sides of the square. Uh, fine. So I'm going to say, um, In this workspace. No, I don't. Bummer. Okay. Um, I'm going to take this box structure and um, I'm going to compute. Sorry for going so far into break, but this is. What happens um, on the fly like this? Um, actually, let me to make life much easier. Much, much easier. Set foo to this list structure. And then I'm going to say, um, replace item two is that list and it's item two that we're interested in. Uh, two with three. And so now, um, we have repeat three, move size steps, turn 90 degrees. Uh, and now what I'm going to do is set definition of square. Uh, oops. Oh, no, that's right. That's fine. We can just go uh, to foo. Yeah. Whoops. No, not to foo. Uh, stupid. A join of foo. And now, if we come back to the square block, it says repeat three. A more interesting thing to do instead of changing square would be to define triangle uh, with a different count and also a different term. But 
yeah to the i think what mary was missing originally is split by blocks gives you an ast join over an ast type list of blocks gives you back something that is runnable in snap uh so uh join has been extended with sort of no other visible changes in how join works but the, the key there is joining that list of blocks back together so actually the thing that i was curious about is a way to do it functionally i kept trying to do it functionally does it have to be done with um, command blocks um no it can be done functionally um the easy way to do that uh is with back quote. Okay. So I could say, um, well, here, let me make a block. Mary, we're having a conversation over in the Berkeley pod, and we realized that we could have functional insert, functional add, functional delete, and functional replace. There's no reason you have to set a variable, replace it, and then use it. You could just have replace of the expression, returning a new list that has the thing it replaced. So that's, I think you and I are on the I same. Reaching for, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think we're on the same page that maybe advocating for functional versions of the four command-based list modifiers. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah. what I did, um, I think, in the manual is I wrote a block called um, deep replace deep replace this value with that value in a list structure. And what that would do is look for the four um, and use three instead. So I wouldn't have to figure out ahead of time exactly where that four is in the list structure. And do you tell it as the programmer where it is in the structure or is it searching? It's not searching. No, it you. searches. <laughs> it, it traverses the tree. So what if you have multiple fours? Sorry? What if you have multiple fours? You have lots of fours in your thing? Yeah. Then you'd have to do something different. Okay. Um, but you know, for the case of the polygon, there's, all there is is the number of sides and the uh, turning angle to change. So uh, now what I'm going to do here, um, Oh, wait, I need another input. Name. So um, now I'm going to perhaps confusingly use join in its ordinary text sense. Um, so I'm going to take the name and stick space underscore there and that's going to be the label of my new block and uh, the body is going to be um uh, i hope this works because backward only works sometimes Oops, no. Um, and again, um, when we are finished creating this feature, you won't have to explicitly pass in this script, but now you do. Um, so I'm going to pick up a repeat block. Um, I'm going to ringify it, uh, put that in here. So repeat, and then I want to say uh, the number of sides. So I want to say repeat sides, but I can't just drag sides in like this because um, when my square or triangle or hexagon block is running, there's no variable named size in its environment. 
So what I'm going to have to do is um, unquote sides um, <laughs> so that I'm evaluating it in the context of the of the Mac this polygon block. And then uh, I'm going to say, um, wait, no, I don't want to do that. I want to. want to join this. Whoops. What just happened? Like that. Um, no, not even that. I have to bring it by this so that I can give it um, let's give it a different name to the oops now not in the um, what type okay so now I want to um Turn three sixty uh, divided by oh, actually, what I want to do. I hope this works. Otherwise, I'll feel silly. Brian, is there a reason you back coded the 360 divided by instead of just the sides there? Yes, thank you for asking. Um, in the finished block, I don't want it to say turn 360 over four degrees. I want it to say 90 degrees. Thank you. Um, yeah. So I wonder if this will work. Probably not. This will probably, oops, no. This will probably be a horrible disaster, but we'll try it anyway. Polygon, hexagon, and six sides. Oops, uh, I didn't want it to be a reporter, but let's look at Well, that didn't work, did it? Um, um, yeah, that's because my polygon block is all on. So, um, um, once you use define, you can throw it away unless you put it in a procedure. Yeah. Well, it's a primitive, so it's, you know, it, it's well, but it, that long thing for defining square. Yeah, yeah. I can when throw all, that away. When it's when we're all done, you're going to see. Um, well, where you know, does it get saved? It's in my way. <laughs> uh, well, 
polygon will have this as its body if you want to that's that's different before you yeah. did polygon it was there after yeah. defining square it was there and it was huge and i wanted to get right rid of it. in hexagon um i it, when i did square which i did by hand yeah, yeah. that worked the way you want it to work uh this isn't working that way because of some bug. No, I'm sorry. I'm asking a different question, a, a yeah. question of just visually. Once you've defined square, yeah, you can get rid of the define. Oh, sure. I mean, the it's, define. There's no define inside square. I, um, I know that, Brian. I'm yeah. asking. Uh, maybe if yes you, answer it's a silly question but it it's if you if you are not going to want to define any more polygon blocks then yes, yes you can delete polygon okay. itself okay but, otherwise it just stays there i well can I save as, it as, as always as always you can close the block editor no this isn't no i i'll ask you later Okay. You're not answering my question. I'm sorry. Um, but I mean, no, the, this define block is not no, going to. It has, it has nothing to do with this example. I see. Okay. It has to do with after you defined square, you had this clunking material around. No, you don't. You don't. Yeah. All yeah. you have is is no, no, this... never mind i'll ask you later in okay. the scripting area there it is and i could just throw it away sorry to take up time no the scripting area it isn't um, no it was brian i'm going back and you're too tired oh to yeah when right when i showed how to do something when how you define... showed how to define square. Yeah, that's right. Then there um, was the, this big clump. about this, yep. Area. Yes. Yeah, so it, this is not needed anymore. So that def definition, the, the way, yes, thank you. Yep. But if I wanted to save it, then I'd have to save it in a separate file if it were clogging my... If you wanted to, um, yeah, Jens is shaking his head. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, you would just you could say you can say export it, this. It, yeah, I could. Okay. And in fact, now that we have smart script pictures, you can just say script pick, um, and the and get a picture of uh, that script, and then well, here let me actually. Um, See, that would be it. wonderful. Thank you. Let me let me actually do it. If I say script pick. So yeah. I now have a picture. Yeah. And if I drag the picture into the costumes tab, it shows up as uh, as a costume. Right. So now if we look at um Let's yeah. Let's close this and let's get rid of the watcher. And now my my sprite. This is my sprite, and it has this as its costume. So that's what happens if you drag the picture into the costumes tab. Um, I'll turn this back. But if instead I drag the same picture into the scripts tab. Um, no, it doesn't. Why didn't that do what I expected? Because you were dragging. You were dragging, you were dragging, you were dragging. Say it again. Dragged in a custom block, not a, not a script. So you should have a polygon definition. Um, yeah, I see it. Well, I do have a polygon definition. So, 
you just have to fool around a little. Yeah, well, right. This um, is great. Thank you. Welcome. So here is the polygon definition. Oh, so yeah, yeah. If I, um, I see if, what you're doing. If, if you export a script pick from the block editor, you get a script file, which is just the block definition without any instance of calling it. Right. So if I um, delete polygon, yeah. yes, I'm sure. Now I can drag, whoops. You could also just import the code from the costume since it's there. Yeah. So now polygon is back from yep. the picture. All right, I'm going to stop because uh, we used up most of the break, I think. What fun. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Bye, all. And, and Mary, your question, the library is not public yet, but will be when it's more stable. Yeah. Okay. Number one, there's okay. a few minutes of break left, then we'll have a couple rounds of uh, talks. Okay. Thank you. Um,